Uma boa tarde, senhoras e senhores. Uma boa tarde a quem nos acompanha através Good afternoon, da transmissão. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Eu sou a Lili Good afternoon Malafaia, for everyone who's online. I'm Aline Malafaia. I'll be your MC here today, so it's an honor to be here with you. On behalf of Prumo, the holding responsible for developing Porto do Açú, Now, we begin Promo Day with the purpose of debating the transition to low-carbon businesses in the port industry, manufacturing, and the Brazilian energy industry. Today, we will hold three panels with relevant names from the Brazilian industry to talk about the challenges and perspectives of this industry related to energy transition. The vector of growth in the state of Rio, the port to do a has a unique opportunity opportunity to make business feasible for new energies, being the entryway for low carbon initiatives in the country. The green hydrogen and wind and solar generation projects inside and next to the port are part of the initiatives that will contribute to put, place Brazil in the spotlight in world efforts for the low carbon economy. We'd like to greet all the officials here today, and I'd like to invite the CEO of Promo, Rogério Sampraia, to give his opening remarks. I'd also like to invite the chair of the board of directors of Vast Infrastructure, Pedro Parente. The floor is yours, Mr. Zampronha. Good afternoon to everyone here today. It's a pleasure to have you here. This is the first Promo Day. We believe this day will be very relevant, and it shows the potential of the development of the state of Rio de Janeiro and Brazil in energy transition. Pedro, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. It's an honor, actually. So I'm definitely sure that we'll learn a lot today. I would like to thank the hundreds of people that are connected on our virtual platform. And I hope that everybody enjoys our conversation here today, which is split into three very relevant panels. As some of you already know, Prumo, who is promoting this event, is a holding controlled by two relevant funds. One U.S. fund called AIG and the sovereign fund from Adubami called Mudaba. Prumo invents, invests in great companies in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil. I'd like to give you an example, which is Porto do Açú, with Jose Firmo, which is the only private port in Brazil, with fantastic figures in volume and efficiency. We believe that it's the most efficient port in operations in Brazil. We have GNA, represented by Bernardo Cessex, the CEO. In addition to being the biggest natural gas representative in Brazil, it's also the plant with the lowest GHG emissions out of all the thermal plants operating in Brazil, which is great. We also control Ferro Part. It's the third largest in Brazil in iron ore and vast, represented by his, the CEO, Victor Bonfim. We're over 30% of the Brazilian oil experts went through. We also control other companies, but those are the biggest ones. Yesterday, I was wondering, what am I going to say here next to Pedro Parenti? So after 15 years, I decided to watch a movie again. Maybe you have seen it. A documentary produced by Al Gore, former vice president of the United States, Inconvenient Truth. And to my surprise, after having watched this movie 15 years ago, the message is the same. 
it's just renewing with new alarming data caused by the growing rate of emissions. So despite all the efforts that started in the same state of Rio de Janeiro back in ECHO 92, despite all the governmental efforts launched back then from companies, governments, and countries, we are still far from a good situation regarding the emissions for the planet. We didn't move as fast as we should have. That is a fact. And the other conclusion that I reached is that human beings are slow relating to their wellness and while their wellness and their wallets aren't affected. So if we feel good, we're just sitting and waiting. But an unfortunate event is expediting this process. So, the, as we can see with the issue of Ukraine and the geopolitical aspects caused by the dependence on the availability of energy among nations could be dangerous. Three weeks ago, I was in Madrid. It was 40, 42 degrees Celsius during most part of the day. And two days later, when I got back, after there was a de governmental decree where public and commercial buildings could not use the air conditioner under 27 degrees so they can spare the use of natural gas. And in that case, people's comfort is affected. I also read a news article about the Italian ice cream man saying that he was now spending 5,000 euros instead of 200 in the month of July in energy. And that affects the wellness and the wallets. The interesting aspect is that this awful scenario is unfortunately happening, and it's a mix of accelerated global warming and scarcity of energy in Western Europe. So that offers Brazil a unique opportunity in development. So we can offer our country a huge opportunity and as big as the agribusiness. And the energy transition is now something that will work in Brazil. Extensive use of green hydrogen, as we've seen in the media, could replace many of the fossil fuels in the long term, bringing back wellness, which humanity is always looking for, and the reduction in the geopolitical dependence among nations. That's extremely relevant, even though we don't talk about it much. On the other hand, Brazil has the conditions to become powerful in the production of green hydrogen thanks to its abundant energy that's very competitive. The wind energy, we have strong unilateral constant wind and amazing sun that bathes Brazil from coast to coast. So the competitive energies are necessary to feed the electrolyzers that will extract hydrogen from water. More than just a true energy transition, we will see a revolution that will put Brazil on the route of accelerated, sustainable path, something that we haven't often seen, and many of you here are part of this transformation. And one of the coincidences here in the state of Rio de Janeiro, and even though I don't have an, an accent from Rio de Janeiro, actually, I was born here many years ago in Rio, but so, exactly here in Rio de Janeiro and in the Açu port, where we will see this revolution develop itself in a sustainable way, with over 30 gigawatts in offshore 
oil projects and licensing with the most efficient port structure in Brazil, with the first plant of green hydrogen that has been announced and will start up in 2025, with 90 square kilometers to develop the low carbon industry, the ASU is definitely the milestone for the revolution. We're going, to we're going to see three panels about businesses with energy transition, use of natural gas and oil production, which is done in a conscientious and responsible way, going through low carbon industrialization. And finally, in the energy revolution, we will see panels conducted by some of the most important executives in Brazil, and women are taking a leading role, and that should have, should have not been different in the past. They'll tell us a little bit about what their organizations are doing to handle the most challenging scenarios that we have experienced. I hope that you all enjoy Promo Day. The energy revolution starts today in Rio de Janeiro and in the ASU port. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Parente, the floor is yours. Someone said that they would give me a slide clicker here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Although I have an accent that doesn't sound like Rio, I am from Rio. I was born in the Santa Lucia Hospital in the Botafogo district. But I just wanted to make sure everybody knows I'm from Rio as well. I was invited by Rogério to give this presentation. And I won't give my traditional talk, which would be standing and not using a cheat sheet, because this topic is a very relevant and serious topic that really deserves us, deserves all the attention and care it requires. So I apologize because I'm going to give this talk sitting here and I'm going to use this cheat sheet here. And you see that my slides start off with EB Capital. EB Capital is the, the manager of which I'm a partner to. And as a in all the coincidences, it is this company is focused on investment that have typical returns in private equity, therefore relevant returns in the mid and long term, but always aim to look at elements in servicing social and environmental needs. And we are also very close to announce a fund that we will invest in, in distributed generation and biogas as well. So it is a huge coincidence, and everybody that works on this have helped me to prepare this presentation. That's why you see this template on the screen. I could legitimately use the Prumo layout or VASTS. After all, I'm the chair of the board of directors at VAST, and I have been the chair at, at Prumo in the past. That's why... I decided to ah. explain all of this to you before I began. Be begin. Let me see where should I point this at. Bom, uh all of us know that energy transition is a challenge that we have taken on. And taken on, that's a very important word, because because it has been taken on by the biggest economies in the world. We had the oil crisis in the 70s, and the discussion started there about how we can improve efficiency of the energy policies and politics and 
Brazil launched pro-alcohol program or pro-ethanol back then, and now it's coming up again because the alternative fuel topic renews the interest in using Brazil's ethanol. We also see a growing environmental awareness, and that is something that's been happening since the 70s but notably in the past five years. So there was much more discourse than effective actions in preserving more or better use of renewable fuels or a lower carbon footprint. And that brought this debate closer to companies and organized society before it was distant from them. So to be true, this actually happened. And you mentioned the Al Gore's video. It did have an impact, but back then, but then it was forgotten, and then Trump came in. So, in fact, he didn't really care about all of that. So, what we see now is that digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization became a common topic in energy transition to, towards a low-carbon economy at the core of climate change, where all of us have seen these problems. From the Paris Agreement to the race to accelerate that it has been intensified, and now we have 60 countries committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. The Americans committed to reduce their emissions by 50% by 2030. Germany expects to reduce 55% by 2026 and achieve neutrality by 2045. And in Latin America, the benchmark is Chile that has a target of electrolysis of 25 gigawatts currently in de under development by the year of 2030. And it's the only country outside the EU with the specific target for electrolyzers aiming at using green hydrogen as the fuel of the future. So be it the fires, forest fires in California, flooding in Pakistan, the drought in, in Europe, the climate change resulting from global warming is giving us more severe marks and signs that are impossible to be ignored. Even the countries that didn't really pay attention to these topics, they were completely skeptical. They are now planning to become carbon neutral, such as China, who promised and whose target is to become net zero in by 2060 and India by 2070. In order for that movement to occur, Coordinated efforts are necessary on many fronts, such as increasing renewable electric energy instead of fossil fuels, expanding the use of bioenergy and green hydrogen, not only in electric energy, but also in the direct use by the industry or manufacturing facilities, transportation and buildings, electrification of transportation systems and manufacturing systems, behavioral changes, obviously, such as using more collective transportation and more efficiency and means of transportation and buildings. In addition to these changes, the objective to achieve carbon neutral by 2050 depends on the continuity of improving the technology. Next slide, please. This chart shows the evolution of global production of energy from the year 2000 to 2050. It is important to pay attention to the colors. The, um, uh, coal is in black, natural gas gray, nuclear energy is yellow. Light green is uh, solar energy and 
Other renewable sources is dark blue, traditional biomass light blue, and modern bioenergy is in that uh, darker uh, color on top of them all. We have chosen one single basis for this study because uh, countries update their plans independently. This is from the International um, Energy Agency towards the goal of uh, 2050. This chart shows the dependency on fossil fuels that goes from 80% to 60% by 2030 and 20% in 2050. Natural gas uh, remains stable to until 2030 and then reducing until uh, 2050, showing that it's a transition source. The, as renewable sources, um, we highlight sun and wind. Also, it is important to emphasize that hydrogen is not in this chart because it's not a source in itself. Rather, it is a means to store renewable um, energy that has been generated. This chart shows how the energy transition towards net zero in 2050 is expected to happen. The column on the left shows emission in 2020. Uh, the 24% in that dark um, bar is added to those emissions until 2030. And then, with the adoption of mitigating measures, we can then go back to a lower level by 2030. And then, from then to 2050, greenhouse gas effects will have increased, but still we will be towards net zero by 2050 because of the renewable sources. It is important that we check the color code from bottom up because it shows us carbon capture other more efficient sources, bioenergy and uh, wind energy, electrification. Now we see hydrogen, energy efficiency, and behavioral measures are part of the mitigating measures. The strongest impact will come from uh, wind and, and solar, followed by electrification. Bioenergy will play a key role until the year 2030, when hydrogen is expected to have matured as a technology to then be able to lead um, the path towards 2050. O papel das novas usinas renováveis, uh, solar, uh, e the new uh, papel da solar, renewable esse, essa, plants essa for, sun, for solar and wind energy. This is the best known means, and that is very familiar to us Brazilians. We do not have to go into um, deep details here. The generating capacity will achieve almost a thousand gigawatts per year, and that investment will be what will allow for a growing um, electrification added to the benefits that have been mentioned by Rogério. This one chart now shows the role played by green hydrogen. 
é utilizado basicamente pela indústria. Green hydrogen today is used basically by chemicals and fertilizers industry. The demand grows every year, 78 million tons in 2018 to 20 million tons by 2020. And this production is based on um, gas, methane, and surprisingly, only 1% of this production is green, and that's where the major opportunity lies. 1% of green comes from water electrolysis. In the next nine years, demand is expected to grow twofold, and that will come from more uh, strong emission industries like transportation and these hydrogen projects are expected to total 80 million dollars and 27% are expected to be implemented in the next 10 years. However, there are several bottlenecks in developing this infrastructure. Unlike biomethane that can be added to the network of natural gas, So the investments in biogas that will be made now can be directly injected in the uh, natural gas network because it's the same molecule. However, the gas pipes will have to be adapted to hydrogen, and we will also need to develop um, the ideal transportation uh, means, and ammonia seems to be the most promising one. Production hubs are, they also seem to be the way to go. Middle East, Latin America, and Australia should be, um, seem to, to be global hubs. And if we consider public policies of Europe and Japan, we can assume that green hydrogen will be the number one strength in this decade. It will become a commodity by 2030, and significant part of the production and demand will be around industrial complexes in where logistics can be competitive. No próximo slide, a gente fala um pouco do papel dos biocombustíveis. Próximo slide. Now, the role of biocombustíveis. Hoje, a biomassa utilizada é basicamente a madeira. The biomass used today is basically from wood that is very uh, polluting and not very efficient. The biomethane and biofuels that are more modern, they have one advantage that is the use of the existing infrastructure, and also because their um, source is residues, which is abundant. So not only uh, vegetal residue like um, sugarcane but gas, but also other sources can be uh, extremely relevant. Sustainable forests will also be a significant source, but the impact of biofuel will not be as strong as hydrogen, but this technology has been uh, more developed and we have harnessed it better. However, bioenergy should not account for uh, 5% of the uh, electricity matrix. And oil and gas now. We have several colleagues who were with Pesto Brás, and I'm so happy to see them all here. I am very 
uh, grateful. And also, I, I miss those days of the oil and gas industry. I remember back then, we used to discuss when the peak of demand would be. And the answer to these questions always brought it closer and closer. Uh, but the point is, oil and gas will exist at least until 2050, but it will have to reinvent itself to become more efficient, especially in the methane operation. International oil and gas companies, not only IOCs, but also uh, state-owned companies, they have become more um, sustainable, that is, transforming into light uh, petrol and to produce gas and oil with least emissions possible. Other industry like cement and plastic will be in the forefront of investments, increasing the use of renewable energies. Some concrete examples of energy transition. For example, uh, repower the Union Europea. Próximo slide, por favor. The repower of the European Union and the Inflation Protection Act of the United States. The repower worked based on the project that was approved during the pandemic, Repower EU, that aims at accelerating the energy transition because of uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine and the consequences in the energy market. Europe believes that we'll need 20 million tons of green energy by 2030, but we'll be able to produce only 10 million tons. So the plan in Europe is very important to us, what Rogério was saying about the Brazilian relevance. The Repower EU provides for the import of 10 million tons of green energy, which is a huge opportunity to us. Also, the European Union expects to increase its methane production uh, tenfold, uh, becoming an alternative in the European Union. Now, the Inflation Protection Act of the United States. The rationale is different. The, it's not limited to green hydrogen, and it gives a better, higher incentive to those producing green energy. And tax incentives are extremely attractive to biomethane production. In this scenario, where is Brazil? Uh, we play a clear role when it comes to hydrogen. Europe needs commercial partners now because they need to import uh, that now because of their insufficient capacity to produce renewable energy. This has been extremely uh, accelerated because of the war in Ukraine. And Brazil is the ideal partner. Our energy matrix has the highest amount of uh, renewable energy, 50% including hydro, solar, and wind. We have unparalleled uh, levels of sun rays, and this is one of the reasons why so many international players are 
para seeking to do business with Brazil when it comes to green hydrogen biomethane because of our because of the residues of our agribusiness and our sugarcane production we are also in a very good position to produce uh, LNG we have what it takes to become a major energy exporter. We have the unique opportunity because of our uh, size and our capacity to produce renewable energy. We, we have uh, all these trends to become one of the major players. Now, how will this transition impact the port industry. About 95% of industrial ports around the world are now discussing this transition because they they were built and developed based on fossil fuels. The only private port complex in Brazil, a has a very good position in terms of what it takes to, to go through the transition of significant part of the global energy demand has this uh, DNA to become energy hubs. The parts that will be successful are those that will be able to attract the value chain of new technologies to their geographies, starting with natural gas that we have today towards production hubs to store biomethane and hydrogen. Beyond energy hubs, it is also important that ports be uh, self-sustainable by generating renewable energy, by leading energy efficiency projects, and by offering fuels that are um, that come from the cleanest source possible. And to wrap up, I would like to say that a support has this unique, unparalleled opportunity. It's Strategic positioning involves all the value chain of what Rogério called um, the green energy. It has the production capacity, the production of HBI, the residues of agribusiness to produce green ammonia, and Eu agradeço a atenção com que me escutaram, espero que tenha sido útil aqui para a nossa apresentação. E uma vez mais, desculpa por eu estar usando uma colinha, mas o assunto, como eu disse, é muito relevante para que a gente pudesse correr o risco de falar alguma bobagem. Obrigado, pessoal. Muito obrigada, Pedro. Muito obrigada, Rogério. The first panel of our afternoon, uh, a support in the production and logistic chain of oil and gas. We have Ieda Gomes, member of the Council of Promo Logistics, Bernardo Prosecchi, CEO of GNA, Victor Bonfim, CEO of Vast Infrastructure, Verônica Coelho, CEO SVP, Verônica Coelho. CEO and President of Equinor Brazil, e Bernardo Persecchi, CEO da GNA. and Bernardo Persecchi, CEO of GNA. Sejam bem-vindos, tem a palavra Felipe Maciel. Welcome everyone, and Felipe Maciel, 
will be moderating this panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you uh, all who have joined us in the social networks. I am Felipe Maciel. I am a director of a news agency focused on energy and oil and gas policies, and also energy transition. This is something that we are always discussing public policies of energy transition. And I believe all the members of this panel have engaged in some of these discussions with us. I thank you all very much for the opportunity. I would like to start by asking a question. I would like to hear everyone's perspectives, and from there, we'll expand our discussion. Also, I'd like to remind you to, this is uh, a free format, feel free to add to what the colleagues will be uh, saying, and Along the, the lines of the previous panel, I would like to say the following. One of the slides showed that the world is moving towards net zero in 2050, but we still have several years of oil in the global energy matrix. I would like to hear from you. What are the opportunities and challenges of oil and gas industry in Brazil so that we can be part of the global market with a smaller carbon footprint? What are the opportunities that we can uh, open by doing so? Would you start, Ieda? <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Prumo, for putting together this event. I am very honored to be a part of this panel. We are undergoing an energy crisis. Crisis of natural gas because there are no reservations and no production capacity to be increased. If this is the result of a geopolitical crisis, and so this is my first remark. Number two, in my very long career, um, and I am originally from Bahia, even though my accent is not very strong, we have gone through several uh, pricing crises of natural gas. We had one in 2011. We had uh, the crisis uh, because of Siberia, but we have also had moments when um, prices were very inviting, like $2 per a million BTUs. This year, we'll see prices like $60 uh, per million BTUs, which is something that's never been seen before. What I can say is that, in spite of the crisis and this catastrophic uh, situation resulting from the war, but also the energy consumers that have been paying extremely high prices, natural gas will remain as a very important fuel during the energy transition. This crisis today is something that was not planned or foreseen. When we refer to 2030 and the 50% reduction of fossil fuels by then, if we don't plan and if we don't do that gradually, we suffer because of unforeseen crises. 
So my message is, gas is very important during the transition because so far we do not have any storage option, uh, 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 nothing other than the hydropower plants in Brazil. So we need large capacity and something that will uh, address the intermittency of those other sources. So, especially by from now to 2024, what I say is this 300 million um, liters of cubic meters of gas from Russia is not being used by Europe. So until we have this other source of uh, liquefied uh, gas, we will remain facing volatility. You from Vast, um, Victor, you you there work with both the private and, and, and public uh, industries. So the challenge of the oil and gas industry of placing uh, oil in the global market, because there is demand, but there is demand for uh, more sustainable gas. How can this uh, opportunity be enjoyed? I believe two words are of the utmost importance today. One is energy transition. As Yeda said, it has to be very carefully planned so that we can protect ourselves from um, problems that may arise. And also responsibility. The companies operating in this market including a uh, vast, we work with a large amount of crude oil and we're investing in the network. And we have to understand what role we play in this transition phase. A company like Vast, for example, during this transition process, I believe the role is for our industry to have a smaller carbon footprint. So we should understand that we are all responsible with towards this goal. Volatile gas emissions, it is very important for the carbon footprint and it is relevant both in terms of the platform and transshipment and that's why we have to be very thorough when planning. There's a study that I read recently from the state government. Uh, the transportation of fuels, and uh, I'm referring to uh, light fuels, not crude oil, if we invest in uh, ducts, we can reduce the carbon footprint by 30% because uh, trucks would be reduced. So we have to be responsible to reduce and committed to reducing the carbon footprint. I also read an article that I found very interesting. It said that the future of oil and gas industry, the midstream, which is our area of operation, and also downstream, it's brown, meaning what? Investments in this industry are incremental. They are necessary for you to have a better planned transition with a smaller carbon footprint. So there is investment in this industry and there are concerns because some investors, they have this extreme 
vision of not investing in fossil fuels at all, but investments are necessary, both for the operators like uh, Equinor, but also those plants, for example, that have to reduce sulfur. The impact is very positive in the reduction of carbon footprint. Investing in ducts to reduce the emissions in transportation, this is also necessary. That's why I believe those are the two most important words. The first one is transition, which must be very thoroughly planned, like Ieda said. And number two, responsibility. We must be responsible in everything we do. And more than that, about VAST. So fuels in its liquid form. And today, in its liquid form, oil, byproducts, and in Brazil, we have the biofuels. So after other fuels come in, such as ammonia or any others that are liquid, when we're capable of managing today's fuels, we will be able to manage the fuels of the future. The transition will be easy. The technology involved in handling ammonia and storing ammonia is far from easy, but that's the objective. Okay, thank you, Victor. Veronica? We'd like to hear the vision of producers. How do you see that challenge? We saw Parente's presentation, and Yeda and Victor also mentioned. Energy security became very strong after all the events in Europe, the energy crisis that's going on there. The transition was discussed separately from security before, but now these two topics are very close. And the oil and gas industry still ensures the security of delivery and efficiency. We have to understand the vision of the producers for those challenges of Brazilian oil for the upcoming years. How do you see those movements, Veronica? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I would really like to thank Prumo for the invitation to be a part of this debate. Prumo is a very important partner to us. Today, we had a meeting with management, and the safety moment was done based on the support that we have at the ASU Porto, the port. And that shows how close we are to all of you. So once again, thank you. If I could go back a little before what is actually going on this year, we were already seeing that the future, which will be an energy transition, it essentially dependent on all the energy sources, and especially oil and gas. If we considered all the forecasts of populational growth on the planet from now to 2040, with more than 1.5 billion of new inhabitants that are expected for these next two decades, and thinking that today over 10% of the population still does not have access to energy, that would be sufficiently clear that we still have to work a lot as a global society to ensure that everyone on the planet, the ones that are here right now and that will come, will have access to sources of energy, energy that makes so much of a difference on the quality of life of any population and community. And that access has to be safe, stable, and fair, a price that is affordable. And the current context only reinforces those characteristics and those issues as being absolutely relevant for all of us. And how easy it is for us to fall into 
So the risk of not having the security and access to energy at competitive and fair prices, as we can see on many places on the planet. In that context, Econor's vision is that the energy transition has to happen. It's actually already happening. And our ambition is to be a leading company in that transition process. But to be a leading company in that process also means that we will have to be a relevant producer of oil and natural gas as they are essential sources of energy of a future growing population where everybody has the right to have access, have access to energy and the benefits that come from that. But the question is, being a producer of oil and gas and natural gas in a climate crisis scenario and also understanding that we are essentially a part of the problem as well as other industries but we are a big part of the problem we do have to, the responsibility of being a part of the solution and that's where our commitment comes to be a part of the solution currently equinor is already very proud to say that our carbon footprints according to scopes one and two meaning all our activities half of the global average of the global oil industries but we're still not happy about that we want to decrease it and a lot regardless of where we operate so obviously that was highly motivated because we are subject to tariffs uh, very high rates in carbon emissions in Norway but regardless we do believe that the future of oil and gas or actually oil and gas in the future has to be competitive and resilient. And that means it has to be resilient in its CO2 footprint and also cost. Regardless of where we operate, even here in Brazil, even if we don't have that tariff that we have in Norway, our vision is still the same. So we also employ all of the potential possible efforts here in Brazil, use technology and equipment to decrease our carbon footprint in a resilient manner and making our product resilient to the future of the energy transition. I can mention many examples like the Peregrino field with heavy oil up to the Bacalhau IBCM 33 fields that will bring on innovative solutions and will be the benchmark in production with a low carbon footprint. Okay, thank you, Veronica. Perseki, we don't have a key, uh, a switch, right? Turn it off and nobody else will use fossil fuels anymore. That's not going to happen. So Veronica addressed something that's fundamental. In a country like Brazil, Many people don't have access to energy yet, and we can't leave them behind. So what about the challenges for the oil and gas industry together, walking hand in hand with the transition, and as Veronica mentioned, being a part of the solution? Good afternoon, everyone partners, colleagues, financiers, future business partners. It's a great pleasure to be here at Promo Day to tell you about the challenges that GNA has and the industry in general. Piggybacking on what Pedro mentioned about the energy transition, Victor, Veronica, and even Rogerio, we talked a lot about the energy crisis brought on by the the war. We didn't really talk about the energy crisis resulting from lack of planning. Like you have vision, you can see that in California with a huge energy crisis given the lack of planning and incentive and lack of incentive to renewable sources. So we may be in the past, but the water crisis that we faced last year, the biggest one in the last 93 years, cannot be forgotten. So the climate effects in a country, especially with an essentially green 
matrix are really challenging. And I clearly remember those moments because we were going to start up GGN1 over 1,000 megawatts, like Rogerio said, the most efficient one. And we were undergoing extreme pressure because of the water crisis. So the thermal power plants are essential in the country so we can guarantee that, so we don't have lack of energy. So gas is the fuel of energy transition, and the thermal power plants are essential in the country to guarantee our energy security, given that we have an essentially green matrix. You can't talk about the future and energy transition without forgetting these types of heat gen electricity generation for the for the future this week is very special for us because on friday it, we will celebrate one year of to go into operation there were four years fighting for that over 12,000 people in the field 25,000 hours without any accidents without with leave so we're well advanced in the construction of the second one, and it will be the biggest and most efficient. So three gigawatts that qualify us as the biggest thermoelectric complex in Latin America, Rogério, not just Brazil. So I'm very proud to be a part of that project, especially because I'm also from Rio de Janeiro, had to say that. And we are well positioned in the support to capture all the opportunities that energy transition and the gas market will offer. The new Gas Act that was recently enacted gives us the foundation to take advantage of that. But we do have 3.4 gigas of energy projects that have already been licensed, PGN, and two gas pipelines. And we'll definitely capture those opportunities that will come up in the future, be it with the BMC 33 or other fields to come. And it could be no different, like in a project like ours, with the kind of partners that we have, Promo, Speak, Siemens, and BP, and the location, which is the ASU port. So we also have first-line infrastructure that Promo and partners were able to install. So GNA is well-positioned and wants to capture and be the vector of that growth and take advantage of all of that. So I'm very proud to be here today. I can say a little bit more about the gas pipelines and how we'll inspect that. I'll leave that for later. Thank you, Perseiki. I'm going to go back to Yera about what he mentioned, the Gas Act. We're going through a moment in Brazil right now of transformation in the natural gas industry. So the, the law was recently approved, the market is starting to open. We have some conversations going on about regulations at the ANP. So yet, I'd like to understand your vision about the Brazilian gas market. What are the possibilities for us here? They're cutting me off here. Well, currently, Brazil produces 134 million cubic meters of gas per day. So it's considered a supply at 55 or 60, maybe a little less, depending on the period. So there's a firm demand of 60, 65 million cubic meters per day. Petrobras is currently the main supplier, but now we have over 30 million cubic meters of gas produced by third parties, such as Acnor, Shell, actually, and Acnor and small 
producers in the Northeast. It's very well diversified now. And now given the new gas act, many of these producers are selling gas in the Northeast, not in the Southeast. We'd love it to love to see it more in the Southeast, but there is a possibility of selling your gas produced in the Santos and Campos Basin at the state of Bahia. They have 10 contracts with everyone here. So that is truly a fact that there is a bigger dynamic and diversification in supply. Producers are going to market and especially selling to distributors because we currently have few consumers of natural gas, only some thermal plants and large industries. How do we see that equation though? Unfortunately, although Brazil produces a lot of gas in the pre-salt, it re-injects over half of the gas that's produced, 60 million cubic meters a day. That's threefold the amount of the gas pipeline from Brazil and Bolivia is re-injected. And part of that is to increase oil production. So the more gas you inject, it increases the pressure and that makes the fields last longer. So it has a lot of CO2 and sometimes it's hard to separate 30 or 40 percent, but there's a part of that gas, maybe 20 million of those 60 could come to the Brazilian market. We do have the biggest gas, Brazilian, mar Brazilian gas market is in the southeast of Brazil, and we are an importing market. So today, that importing market, when you do the math, you have a firm demand of 60 to 65 million that reaches 90 when you have the thermal plants sending when there's no water during a drought. But in the firm demand, the domestic production can only pro uh, service 45. So we have to import gas from Bolivia or LNG. The gas from Bolivia, right now we're going through an interesting situation. The initial was 30 million cubic meters per day, went down to 20 contractually. And in the winter, Bolivia, has been only delivering 15 because they contracted with Argentina. Argentina was importing LNG. They were going to import 60 ships this year at a price of 35 to $50 per million BTUs. They knocked on Bolivia's door and got an agreement where they deliver more to them at a higher price. So currently Bolivia is getting $21 per million BTUs in that part of the pie where they negotiated a higher price. With that, they decreased supply to Brazil. And we are currently experiencing a situation where you see Bolivia's production is falling. And at least in the short term, they don't have the capability to increase, even if they invest in exploration in the long term. So if Brazil doesn't get the gas from Bolivia in enough amount, we would have to import more LNG, where the market situation of LNG is that the price is going up. I'm going to mention some other things, but for Brazil, the important thing is to establish operating and regulatory conditions so that part of the gas that is currently being re-injected can come to the coast and to the Brazilian market at competitive prices. And also considering that infrastructure of bringing in gas from 300 kilometers away, 2,000 feet meters down costs a lot. So Route 3 has been built for seven years. I was, the, that gas pipeline was built in two years for between Brazil and in Bolivia, Route 3 in seven years. So things are taking longer to get all the permits. We weren't able to do a public offering for the 11 kilometers. So anyways, it's important to establish the contractual and regulatory matters to bring in more. And then I'll mention other things later. Thank you, Yeda. Victor, about the diversity that Yeda mentioned in the gas market, so new players coming in and new gas producers is already a reality in the oil market. For a while now, we've had players, not just Petrobras, 
Como é que hoje o, o, o so aborto da how Avast pode ser um diferencial? Does the support and Avast be a differential for those companies that are producing and operating oil production in Brazil? And if I'm not mistaken, you account for almost 100% of the privately owned operations é, é aí, and oil. Is that correct? The challenges and opportunities that they can bring on for these operators. Temos o, o desafio do microfone aqui. <laughs> Alô, foi. É... So that's very interesting what you mentioned. Funny, when you mention Brazilian oil production and exports, some of the data surprise people who aren't part of the business. So the first thing is that Brazil exports 1.6 million barrels a day, approximately. That varies on a monthly basis. And that's very significant growth. Three or four years ago, Brazil was only exporting 800 barrels. So the growth is a lot, and it's easy to understand why, because Brazilian oil production has grown a lot, and successfully, especially with pre-salt. And the refinery center for Brazil is what we have. We haven't built any large refineries in the past years. So the inter the domestic consumption of oil is constant with growing production, and obviously it has to be exported, and that's what's happening. So in six or seven years, we may export three, three million barrel, 300, 3,000, excuse me. So of the 1.8 billion exported today, half is Petrobras, and half are international companies. So Econor, Shell, Petronas, Qatar Oil. So a number of companies that are already Petrobras partners in the fields in the, on the Brazilian coast, especially in offshore oil, that export the, the volume. Once again, going back a little and touching on the previous one about responsibility of industries such as ours that act in the midstream, that's a different segment than the operation of exploration and production, is that the logistics hub for oil exports because the current terminals that were built by Petrobras in the past century, they were built when Brazil was focusing on importing oil, especially Arab oil. And now Brazil is becoming an exporter. So there's a need to invest to face that growth in exports in a responsible way, in a sustainable way, because exporting 3 million barrels a day is not just something ordinary for a country like ours in a small region, because it's in the Campos and Santos uh, basin production. So you have to face those challenges, and that's a huge challenge for a country like ours, and that's why we, that's where we act, so we can assist them, especially international companies, as Petrobras already has a very good installed capacity for their volumes. Nice, Victor. Veronica? I can't hold back. As a journalist, I have to ask you about an update of Econor projects in Brazil. Can you tell us how Bacalhau, Peregrino are doing the projects that you've been developing here in Brazil? Yes, of course. First of all, I'd like to start by saying that here in Brazil, we are well positioned, and we've mentioned that a lot today, and it's a common point of everyone who's speaking here, but also at Econor, we saw that Brazil really has a very favorable and promising potential, and in oil and gas, we have the ambition of growing a lot our portfolio. Portfolio. And among our global strategy, we're committed to our present and future oil production is to streamline it and make it more resilient. And for that, prioritizing where and when we can invest to produce more 
has been a very clear direction for us, strategically speaking. With that, we've already made the decision of leaving some countries. Across the last year, we announced that. And leaving some activities in countries with that decision also comes the decision to have expand our presence where we decide to be. And Brazil is one of the key places where we decide to be and we want to grow. We have the ambition to grow beyond the portfolio that we currently have. So that's the update of our projects. We're very happy and proud. I'm particularly proud to have Peregrino producing again at very good levels, approximately 70, 80,000 barrels a day, with the potential of really growing and gas coming in to Peregrino so we can change and switch instead of having diesel as uh, a source of energy. It would be the gas from Route 2. And the next platform or rig is being commissioned, and then we can announce some news pretty soon. Peregrino is doing well after two very difficult years with the pandemic and all the limitations that we had with logistics, offshore logistics resulting from the pandemic and the care that we had to have with our people, a lot of investments being made by the company. Since July, July 16, we started up Peregrino again. That's very important to us. In addition, a fundamental partnership with Petrobras at Roncador, where we were able to leverage all our expectations and plans concerning the additional reserves that we saw as possible at Roncador, and we were able to approve that over 20 new wells together with Petrobras. And we have drilling for a long time. So, a profitable life together with Petrobras for a long while. And Bacalhau, still in production. Fact is that the hull and some important parts of the ship are being built in China, and with everything that's going on in China and all the other challenges with COVID has been a huge challenge. But we're still at, we're at full speed ahead. And at the end of the month of September, beginning of October, we should start drilling the wells with the first drill from said drill. And next year, we'll have a second drill in Bacalhau. It's the first well to be drilled is for assessment on the north side of the field, which is essential for us to determine and recognize the development of that. And after that, the second drill will continue in parallel to that, creating these producing wells so we can maximize the potential of protection and so that we can get there. Our perspectives is that by the end of 2024, and when we that's when we start production in the field, so the objective is to have as much as we can, obviously, considering all the safety requirements, is having these wells ready to begin production at Bacalhau. The FPSO at Bacalhau really makes us proud, and it's been the biggest one in production. Petrobras has one that's a little bit bigger. It's going to be self-production of energy and with a carbon footprint that's under nine kilos per barrel produced. And I like to say that that's going to be broken by the other one, number 73, where it start, will start up. And the other project that's essential for Brazil that will give 16 million cubic meters of gas per day production, so 15% of the demand in Brazil when it starts, when it starts up. 
para o so, mercado doméstico aqui. That que gas will be taken to the alinhado, domestic market, também. and we're really é excited about that, e and our partners é, to continue on this project. So a lot of things, a lot of things are happening, a lot of ambition, but a lot of things are new. We have a lot on our plate, a lot to do. We're very excited, though, with the investments here in Brazil. Nice. Thank you, Veronica. Perseiki, you, everybody's talking about the increase in the gas supply. So how would more gas coming in bring in new investments to Assu? How do you see that possibility? for you and the availability of more gas. Thank you, Philippe. Well, building on what Yeda mentioned and now what Veronica mentioned, we have licensed two gas pipelines. We have a previous a prior license. One's called Gazoagar, 50 kilometers connecting TAG and Gazinf, 100 kilometers connecting 10 PS. So they're structuring pipelines and conceived from the beginning that will be not only to flow LNG, and we have idle capacity, and that could supply plant one, plant two, and we have future projects that might require LNG outside ASU, but also bring in domestic gas, not only for our expansions for 3.4 gigawatts of licensed projects that I mentioned, but other less intensive projects that potentially may be installed at the port. And I know there are some potential clients, some are looking at me right now, I won't mention their names, that's our intention. So BMC 33 is a target gas for those gas pipelines and these customers. And we have much more gas, as Yeda mentioned, that's being re-injected, and that could be used in a more efficient and economic manner. And I believe that the big challenge is to create the conditions so that this exploration or that efficient economic use happens with the new gas act that really helps in that and today these gas pipelines are close to be announced and become possible given that gas act which is what created the regulatory mechanisms for the approval of the gas pipelines in a more efficient and faster way that's something that's still to be adopted but this this gives a lot more certainty, a more permanent base of gas lines. We have just a fraction of what Argentina has, which does not correspond to the magnitude of gas production of our country. And we are very close to having the gas pipes and, and we will have this support we are at this point ready to to capture the this growth opportunity yeah the, in your previous uh, speech um, I'd like to understand what you said about the the mix and especially from now on do you expect there to be any any change and what are the needs we have so that we can improve in regulatory terms or maybe infrastructure? Only God knows uh, the future, but what is it that would be desired for the mix? Supplies like Equinor, adding 10 million cubic meters more every day when Route 3 is ready, and then another 18 million more. Several other producers, maybe 15, I believe, that would 
que reduziria muito a nossa necessidade de um very important supply that would reduce our need for LNP LNG and our associated gas It's difficult to obtain because of the variation in the thermal plant profile. Also, we here in Brazil, we are the 10th biggest economy in the world. We have all kinds of industries, um, food industries, steel, um, automotive, and the demand for natural gas is not growing because the prices are very high. But if there's an excess in supply, with no need for the marginal molecule to be LNG, this will mean opportunities for which a sul port is very well located. There's uh, LNG that's already there, and there's this huge area right in the heart of the southeast Brazil. So, for the future, if I could do some three uh, magics, I would uh, first I would provide for a, a better uh, pricing, better price negotiation. Number two, I would say that a support is in a very good location for that, uh, which is investing in offshores, because if you analyze the consumption in Brazil, you see that wind is counter-cyclical. When there is a valley in water, there is a peak in wind energy production. And the offshore wind can account for 50 or 70 percent of production, and that reduces the dependency. Uh, wind offshore is the number one, I believe, and then uh, sugar, as Rogério said, because it has a very good uh, base that's already installed. Now, uh, in, in last month of July, in the United Kingdom, there's a contract of offshore wind at a price that has never been seen before, 70% cheaper than the prices of 2015. So, the offshore industry today can offer much better prices, and we need this auction uh, because this will help uh, Brazil. And finally, to accelerate Brazil's position in terms of hydrogen, even though we don't have a lot of uh, gas lines, as my colleague was saying, we have uh, we don't have enough, but we are strategically positioned to export green energy to international markets. The energy transition will indeed take place. It is inevitable. And a country like Brazil that has the energy, has uh, logistics, has a deep water uh, plan, uh, port, and uh, plan, uh, port, and the ability to store ammonia. Well, if Chile exports 300 gigawatts of uh, green Hydrogen. Well, in Brazil, we're talking about 3,000. Well, if you allow me, your first suggestion, uh, Ied, I would like to add to what you said. 
Elas hoje, por conta da característica de flexibilidade... Thermal plants today, because of how seasonal they are, they cannot be the... They're not a perfect anchor for uh, natural gas, because the associated gas needs consumption in the basin. So why not encourage auctions for the specific needs of each geography. Uh, there's a lot of solar and wind in the Northeast. Uh, another example is uh, the pre the subsalt in the Southeast. So this is how we can benefit from the different uh, the different scenarios, and that would help the economic uh, benefit from this gas and make and also taking into consideration that our infrastructure is not uh, sufficient today. And you say that the auctions could be coupled with the oil project. Yes, the, the the, the timing of offshore developments will be key to associate uh, that with thermal plants. You will be working with the field so that you can address both projects simultaneously and the associated risk of the offshore project and also the risk of the thermal project and everything that it entails. It is difficult to put it together, but this is something that really deserves our thorough attention. The thermal plants themselves uh, in terms of the anchor, the industrial customers are uh, an anchor, but as an asset, it can be feasible in the long term. I believe you agreed. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I do agree. Thermal plants can be uh, an opportunity to anchor the offshore projects. It can be very positive. As long as we can coordinate the timing of the projects, it is definitely something we've been working with, trying to uh, solve this issue, but I fully agree that this is an opportunity that we should um, study very carefully. In terms of the logistics, I have a question. How do you see the competitive advantage that VAST has for being close to most uh, Brazilian oil production. How do you uh, strategize because of your geographic location and all the oil that is produced there in uh, Campos uh, and Santos basins also? I would like to touch on something that I believe to be very relevant. I'm an engineer. Before being an executive, I worked as an engineer for very long, and, and engineering is very dear to me. I really like hearing what the, the, the other panelists here are, are saying in terms of the gas challenges, uh, and we working with uh, energy in a liquid form. Well, I would love to begin my career in engineering today because the technological uh, challenges that the country, that the, that society as a whole will now face to implement all of that in a responsible way. I find it beautiful. I find it beautiful to be involved, not just as an investor or someone who can 
provide a solution. But as the technological part, the engineering part, how fuels of the future will be uh, handled, how they will be managed, what are the maritime fuels of the future? There are those who believe, believe in SAF, those believe in ethanol, and all the technology that will have to be developed throughout the chain. These are amazing challenges, and to be an engineer in such a scenario is really amazing because it demands uh, a lot of solutions, and there will be a beautiful competition also. And we want to position ourselves in a primary position of the fuels of the future, gas or liquid, and to watch for the technologies that will appear. As a midstream company, we will be ready for the solutions that future brings. So this is a technological challenge, but it's a very, very amazing one. I believe this to be a huge opportunity for this younger generation to work and come up with solutions uh, for the country. As Pedro said in his presentation, I believe Brazil is very well positioned when it comes to energy and also in terms of what is yet to come. Um, Sugarcane ethanol, corn ethanol, several other alternatives. I believe the country itself has the opportunity to develop its economic and technological uh, solution that matches um, the reality of our country. So we humbly position ourselves as a midstream company to help uh, enable these solutions. We're getting close to the end of our first panel, but I would like now to give the audience a chance to ask questions. If anyone has any questions, please just just raise your hand and we will be here to ask the questions. And, uh, and now a final comment from each of the participants. Yeah, the your final remarks for our audience. I would like to thank uh, everyone for the opportunity. Uh, you are always brilliant as a moderator, Felipe. Uh, a, a country with such a huge territory as Brazil, the 10th economy in the world. Um, Logistics is very important. As a member of the board of Pluma, I would say that the support and the logistic solutions that it may offer, they are key for the development of the Southeast and also uh, the country, be it with hydrogen, with uh, transshipment, with um, anything. And today, the world population, the country's population, so worried about governance. When you have a privately held uh, company that is so involved with uh, sustainable development, it is great to see that you can work and think of future solutions in such a manner. Well, after Yeda's response, I'm in a hard spot here, but anyway, Pluma and its uh, affiliate companies, they are very responsible in the way they address um, energy and all this transition 
aiming at a smaller carbon footprint by enabling the technologies of the future. That's where we're headed. And there is more than one company under this umbrella of the port, and they are definitely aligned in a unique way. If there's uh, an agreement between Shell and a support, for example, to produce green energy, we immediately say, well, if that's green ammonia, we're here willing to uh, offer storage. This is very important that everyone be engaged. Uh, anyways, thank you all so much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this panel. Veronica? Something that was said by everyone here and by Pedro in the previous panel is the potential of our country. As a Brazilian, I am so excited to hear that. But there's a long way between our potential and what will effectively happen for us to put it to use and for the investors. This is something I always insist on. We must make sure the country offers certainty, stability uh, in terms of regulations and legal certainty as well, so that we can reduce the risk of our country and we can be more competitive for all these projects. This is something I always repeat. If we want to grow and we are planning uh, to invest in offshore wind energy and all these uh, projects in the pipeline that include both online and offshore energies. Something that is really unique, very few countries have uh, this kind of project. So it's always very important to remind everyone, especially in times of political campaign, that we must offer legal certainty and competitiveness to investors. And before I uh, finish my remarks, I would like to say that everyone here is uh, from the city of Rio and very um, enthusiastic about that. Well, I am from the state of Rio, and I know how important the investments made by Puma in that region are extremely important. Uh, so thank you all for believing in, in that region, and I wish you all uh, a lot of success. Well, after all these comments, I will try to give my contribution. I don't want to be repetitive, but last week, uh, a training program, professional training program was launched and in this diversity week, it is such a pleasure to be part of this panel with my colleagues Yeda and um, also Veronica, of course, my male colleagues as well. But it is important that we have more diversity in our industry. It is important that we have uh, this diversity, and we're working for this end. So it's really rewarding to be a part of this panel, especially in this week, 
and uh, to have uh, two female colleagues as part of this discussion. Uh, well, and just before we close, uh, I, just like Veronica, I am from the state of Rio, not from the city of Rio. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to be here with us. I would like to thank everyone who is connected um, with Obrigada us through social media. Thank you all very much. Excellent discussion, excellent panel. I would like to once again express our thanks to those who have joined us either in person or virtually. And we will now have our second panel with uh, José Firmo, CEO of a support, Marcelo Chaya, CEO of Turnium, and Solange